Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in this webinar, uh, Spinal Care, Understanding Back and Neck Pain, presented by the ACH Orthotic Department, uh, Orthotic Surgery Department. Uh, we have a panel of three speakers uh, from the SPI service, Dr. Ruben So, Dr. Fong Pauling, and Dr. Marcus Ling, who will uh, share with you uh, some like uh, information on the condition and then as well as the management available for them. Uh, before we start, uh, just a gentle reminder that you can submit the questions uh, throughout uh, the session by the Q&A button, and our speaker will address them at the end of the session for you. Uh, without further ado, Lee, uh, let me welcome the first speaker, uh, Dr. Ruben, who will share with us on the first topic, movement is life. Dr. Rubens, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Samuel. Uh, um, and uh, first of all, a warm welcome to all the participants of this uh, webinar on uh, Saturday morning. Um, I'm uh, most pleased to share a bit about the, what we do, and in particular, about the uh, neck and back pain which is uh, quite commonly uh, affecting our individuals that come to our clinic. Uh, we have, uh, so far, I think it's very encouraging. We have about 570 participants this morning. So warm welcome to all of you. Um, my name is Ruben. I'm one of the senior consultants here in SGH. And uh, I'm, I'm, my talk should take simply something about 15 to 20 minutes before I hand over to my colleagues. Uh, of course, if any time that you have any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, let us know what your questions are and we'll do our very best to answer them by the end of this uh, webinar. So uh, perhaps for the administrators, uh, uh, would you allow me to share my screen? Thank you. So, uh, once again, you know, we do see quite a number of patients who have back and neck pain in uh, SGH. It is uh, really one of our most common uh, presenting complaints when it comes to the uh, orthopedic clinic. And, uh, and in particular, I think the reason really is because we spend some time to uh, let's analyze why we have this problem. So you can see here that the spinal column has a number of uh, uh, mobile segments. And these mobile segments, of course, are uh, in the cervical spine, which is your neck, and in your lumbar spine, which is in your low back. And uh, these areas here, of course, as you can see from this uh, picture of this uh, lady doing yoga, that, that they are highly, highly mobile. And because they're the most mobile regions, therefore, they undergo the, quite a fair bit of wear and tear when it comes to the daily mobility and during the activities of daily living. What is probably most common that we you may be seeing now is that many of us are working from home. And uh, this is, of course, partly due to the COVID pandemic. But uh, and, and you find that the work environment that most of you are sitting in actually are mainly on dining tables, sometimes in the bedroom, sometimes on the couch. And actually, these are not really ideal uh, places. And often you find that after a day of uh, working and all the... Zoom and all the webinars and all the emails, you have this uh, bad neck ache. Now, the reason for this really is because the position may not be that fantastic and your posture really does matter when it comes to working uh, in the, at the home. So we know that uh, there are some better sitting postures that are, are important to pay attention to. So this uh, picture taken from uh, the Hong Kong Standard is uh, demonstrating what are some things to pay attention to. Now, of course, you can see there are these angles that you are measuring. And I think for us, many of us at home, we are working from a laptop. So I always tell my patients that it's a good idea to uh, set up a home office by buying a monitor and also then placing the monitor on several reams of paper. And this paper will then prop the monitor up. Of course, for those of you who are still uh, having some old phone books, the phone books can work the same as your uh, reams of paper to prop your monitor up at the eye level. 
However, what I think most important is really the important need to take breaks every 15 minutes. And these breaks actually allow you to move and uh, stretch your spine and allow you to then be able to uh, refocus. But importantly, it takes away the stress from your joints in your uh, neck as well as in your low back. Of course, this is, uh, can only be made worse by uh, the usage of quite a number of high devices. Uh, TechSnack or TechNeck is uh, getting quite uh, commonly seen. Uh, patients complain of neck pain, particularly when they have been working on their mobile device or their mobile phone. And the amount of email and work applications that are available on the go now in your, in your handheld device is usually uh, increasing. And certainly this is uh, not a great way to uh, promote neck health. And so I think it's important that uh, if one is uh, doing quite a lot of work and you know that you're going to be there for a while to do some application or some email, it's important to prop the device up uh, high and maybe you have a desktop stand and then allow you to then work um, much better. Now, the weight of strain, of course, is increased when you look down more. And you can see here that when uh, thankfully most of our, when you look in the MRT or you look in the um, offices, most of our, page, our people are in group one and group two. Having said that, it is already a significant amount of weight. Can you imagine carrying uh, 20 kilograms on your head for a good half an hour? I think this is certainly something quite uh, stressful. And so I think that it's important to really have some pay attention, paying attention to the kind of posture that you have when you're using your mobile phone. Now, how does this neck pain come about? So, of course, there are many complex structures in the neck. Uh, you can see here the front and the back, there are so many nerves and bones and discs. But I think essentially the what that we focus on, on really, especially when we come to our, to our treatment, is ma managing the disc as well as managing the facet joint, which is located in the back of the spine. So if you can see from these two images, this, the front of the spine is uh, seen on the top right hand image, while the left, uh, bottom left image is actually showing the side view of the spine, which then allows you to see the, 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 the sort of roof tile like pattern that you see in the back of the neck, which is the facet joints. And these are actually the pain generators of the patient's uh, neck pain. And, uh, and is therefore the target of us, our treatment, when it comes to patients presenting to the clinic with this problem. So what happens in the cervical spine when you apply a load is that you start having things like uh, bone spurs and slip discs. As you can see here on this x-ray, you can see that there are some bone spurs seen in the front of the neck. Um, and when we zoom in onto the MRI spine, which is used to look for nerve compression, we can see these same bone spurs are also seen at the back of the neck, which can cause some compression of the nerves. We also can see mild disc bulges. And uh, when you can see sometimes these bone spurs also have, in addition to that, a prolapse disc, which is the amount of material that is black in color seen behind the yellow dotted line. Now, this certainly cannot be helpful for the nerves. You can see that the nerve is compressed in this image. And actually, all of this consists of what we call cervical spondylosis, which is a medical terminology for wear and tear. In uh, this desiccation, we see many of our patients having uh, neck pain, and they practically tell you that the pain is painful after being on the work on the desk for a while, maybe an hour or so. And this is due to the loss of water and the loss of the shock absorption capability of the disc. You can see here in orange that there is uh, less um, water in this disc versus the white, more white in color this below, which is uh, showing a more normal looking disc. And this is akin to a shock absorber in the car or a very worn out pillow uh, in the bedroom. And so when we lose water, we no longer have a shock absorber that's working so well. And as a result of that, there's more loading on the joints, there's increased joint pressures, and that's the source of our neck pain. What happens, of course, if it's prolonged is that this loss of this height will then lead to uh, bulging of the disc into the canal, which can cause some pinching of the nerve and can also cause the facet joint to lose its stability, which then causes uh, compression of the nerve, such as here, as you can see in this MRI scan. 
thankfully, most of the treatment can be uh, treated by non-surgical means. And so non-surgical means largely are non-pharmacological and pharmacological, meaning taking medication and some non-medication treatment. So most importantly, if there's bad pain, uh, remember to rest. Uh, it is also important to seek treatment by looking at our physiotherapist. A mild fraction of the soft, with a soft collar may be helpful. And sometimes some heat packs is useful as well. In the acute setting, cervical traction is uh, useful, as you can see here. And uh, of course, it's not so useful when it comes to chronic pain. Uh, when seeing your doctor, sometimes they may prescribe you some pain medication such as uh, Panadol or NSAIDs. And these are then uh, helpful in reducing the amount of pain in the, in the neck, particularly targeting the pain generators. I recommend many of my patients to do a bit of uh, neck stretches and swimming and also the ability to be able to do some uh, movement or range of motion exercises. And then uh, this is chin tuck exercise. And this chin tuck exercise tries to place the neck more posteriorly located such that to reduce the stress on the joints in the neck. And I feel that uh, this is uh, something that is very effective for my patients. And I rec hi highly recommend these exercises for them. But in addition to that, of course, when you see your physiotherapist, they do recommend all these exercises as well. Acupuncture has also been shown to be effective in acute and chronic neck pain. Now, of course, if all these fail, then we can do talk about uh, some surgical management. And often what we do is that when we see that there's nerve pinching or nerve pain, then we may need to do a surgical decompression. And generally for younger patients, I will choose for a, um, a disc replacement because these patients are able to want to maintain their range of motion and they continue to have a, want to also then have a, the ability to go back to all of their sporting activities. So what's the rationale behind the disc replacement? Essentially, the, the spine is actually uh, moving in many positions across uh, bending and, and extending the neck. And so when, when there is a movement of the disc, we need to replace this spacer with something that can still move. And so this is a disc replacement that you can see in the diagram in the bottom right-hand corner. And this bottom right-hand corner shows how the disc replacement works. And of course, by putting in this device into the space in between the blue and the gray, then the space is increased. And this gives the relief of pain and both neck pain as well as uh, neck, uh, nerve pain, which is down the arm uh, for the patient. We generally do this through a minimally invasive procedure. And usually what happens is that uh, you can see that the scars are quite this is at the early post-op period, maybe at about two weeks. And uh, these are the x-rays, how it looks like. And then, of course, when, when they bend and extend, as you can see that the disc replacement is working very well. And this patient has gone back to their normal activities as well as their sports. Uh, they are also walking at day one or day zero. And in about a few months' time, you can see that it fades away to almost nothing. And so I think this is one of the benefits of doing minimally invasive surgery for the neck. And uh, certainly we do see many of our patients benefit and go back to their sporting activities. How about the low back then? So you, one can see that actually there's a lot of uh, uh, back pain emphasis and particularly so if you can see here in the Straits Times article. And of course the article is uh, focusing about work from home as well. Now, most of the pain in the low back is mechanical in nature. And thankfully, most of them are sprains and strains where they will go away after a short period of rest. However, some patients will, of course, then have some age-related degeneration and may have spinal stenosis or prolapse disc or what we call slip disc. And of course, in some cases, it may be even more than uh, just slip disc, but it can be osteoporosis or, or some um, degeneration, which uh, my colleague Dr. Fong will cover later on. So prolonged sitting actually loads the spine, but particularly the disc which you see here in the lumbar spine. So this is uh, something interesting for all those who are um, mechanical and or, or those who have engineering interests. You can see that when you stand, actually the load is about 100%, but when you sit, 
uh, at 90 degrees is about 140%. That's already more than normal. And if you lean forward, that's even worse. There's even more loading of the disc. And as a result of this, there's actually increased pressure. And over time, the, the spine develops some wear and tear from this increased pressure. And of course, you have a very unhappy uh, situation following that. Now, the, of course, the pain sources, of course, can be the facet joints or the disc. And uh, in general, I find that many of our patients come with uh, disc-related problems such as annular tears. And of course, a degenerated picture where it is very worn out. This is also seen in a slightly older age group, which uh, Dr. Fong will cover later on. So annular tears are quite common. They can be alarming in the first two or three days. It's a very sharp pain in the low back. And patients can also have leg pain because this tear is located very near to the nerves that go down the leg. However, it is transient, this leg pain, and then it gets better. And often what happens is that it, is, uh, it will tend to heal by itself, but it is very painful. Pro multiple annular tears can lead to a prolapse disc, but often patients who are very worried that they have a slip disc, they come and ask me, is this a slip disc? And they, actually, the answer is not yet. Uh, because and when you start having this back pain, one should then start taking preventive action to prevent these tears from staying there and from becoming bigger tears, which then allow the jelly which is seen here called nucleus pulposus in the center of the spine that can come out and push on the nerve. So of course, when we look at all these uh, patients who have back pain, um, we tend to do some x-rays to look at their spine. And we also perform MRI scans to look at the amount of nerve compression. And if uh, one can see here that uh, when looking at the nerve compression, if the canal is very narrow, then that means that there is a positive confirmation of uh, nerve compression. Of course, this is in addition to the fact that there is some leg pain and a sign of uh, pinching of the nerves when, from the story as well as from the physical examination. So thankfully also, most of the time, they can be treated by non-surgical measures such as physiotherapy and core strengthening as well as acupuncture. And we also do give them analgesias, uh, energetic such as Panadol, uh, Gabapentin, Pregabalin, which are medicines to help with the pain. Failing all these uh, treatment, uh, we find that around 30% to 20% of our patients require some sort of surgical management. And this is where I think uh, later on, Dr. Ling will talk a bit about minimally invasive surgery, which is uh, something that I perform as well. Uh, and this is often our first uh, treatment when it comes to managing uh, nerve pinching, particularly so for younger patients. What has been uh, more exciting is recently we have been performing more uh, lumbar disc replacement because we are seeing that there are many patients who are wanting to continue on that kind of level of activity that they had before. And uh, uh, the good news, of course, SJ has been performing lumbar disc replacement since 2001. And you can see here that there are many designs available in the market. And so over the time, we see continued improvement in the industry design such that it tries to replicate as close as possible the lumbar disc movement during uh, normal daily activity. Now, in this case here, you can see this are the ranges of motion of the disc is forward, backward, sliding as well as the rotation. And this is implanted into the spine in the lumbar region. Now, this is a patient who of mine who had previous decompression five years ago. However, she proceeded to continue to have leg pain uh, after a recent fall. And despite my best attempts at doing non-surgical management, she was not able to perform and she started having problems with even turning up at work because of the pain. And so we started, discussed about this and, you, and I offered her a lumbar disc replacement. Now, how does this work? The disc collapse causes, uh, which is already a worn out disc, causes nerve pinching. And you can see that the nerve space is very narrow within the magenta and the yellow color. And when we insert a lumbar disc, it actually props up the space and achieves nerve decompression. However, this propping up, it remains mobile. And so what happens is that this propping up will allow them to be able to go back to their mobility. And you can see here that this is a 
situation where this is the post op uh, image where there, there's a very small, minimally invasive scar in the patient's uh, tummy. And you can see here that this is how the implant works by bending forward and bending backwards that is moving very nicely to replicate the natural motion of the spine. So this is uh, how my patient looks like at about two weeks. You can see how she is moving. And you can see how the spine is moving backwards and forwards and replicated by the movement of the lumbar disc in the spine. So what can I do for neck pain and back pain? I would recommend for all those who are desk workers to keep moving, do take breaks. Uh, water cooler breaks are great. Um, and if they, you're working from home, go into the kitchen and pour yourself a cup of water. Consider a work environment. Maybe a standing desk will be helpful in reducing the amount of stress on your neck and back. And of course, some core strengthening training by Pilates. I think that things that are important in having good amounts of uh, um, core strength when it comes to protecting yourself from back and neck pain. Now, of course, my concluding remarks about this is if you watch your posture, I think you will try to delay your back and neck uh, wear and tear. Uh, I would recommend that if it's troubling you that you will start seeking some treatment for physiotherapy, but also if possible to start some swimming. And if these uh, don't do so well and you find that the pain continues, please ask your surgeon or whether there's a disc replacement option because this allows the motion to come back and to provide the continued mobility and your enjoyment of your daily activities and sports. Right. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> all right, I'd like to just hand over the time to uh, Dr. Fong. Um, Hello, everyone. Hi, good morning and welcome to the Spinal Care Talk by SGH Spine Service. Uh, my name is Pauling, I'm one of the consultants in the Spine Service in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. I'm happy to share with you today more about back pain, but my focus will mainly be on the aging spine because that's my interest and that's my area of practice. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about uh, what are the important things to do in back pain in the elderly, what are the red flag signs that you need to watch out for so that you can bring yourself to see us earlier. And of course, uh, the important thing about osteoporosis and how does it affect the elderly. So uh, my content of the talk today will be mainly on aging and its effects, uh, back pain in the elderly and what do we do. A little bit on osteoporosis and how can we help uh, alleviate it as well as the complications associated with osteoporosis as well as a little bit of surgery in the elderly. Uh, we all age, you know, it's a process that one undergoes with time, but more importantly, we need to age gracefully. What is aging graceful? And that is to have healthy aging, whereby we can still continue to do our own activities at our own pace, continue to spend time with our family and be in less pain. However, as we continue to age, mechanical stressors with poor muscular strength as well as physiological changes that's brought about in aging, brings about a lot of problems uh, as we continue to grow older. Uh, back pain is one of the, as Dr. Rubenso has stated, is one of the most common presentation that we actually do see in our clinic. It does not only affect the old, but it also affects the young. The majority of them, as previously stated, have mechanical back pain that resolves usually in about six weeks. However, there are certain groups of back pain that will require us to uh, pay closer attention and therefore uh, be more wary about. So what are these signs that you really need to sit down and be careful about and know when to seek help? That back pain that actually prevents one from sleeping and awakens one uh, uh, from sleep is a bad sign because this is also known as night pain. Night pain that is persistent can be... Uh, 
telling of signs that possibly point to more sinister causes. Accompanying symptoms of weakness and numbness in the legs are also something that we need to be concerned about because this would mean that there's some degree of nerve compression. Associated bladder and bowel disturbances that are new and not previously seen in oneself. Signs of systemic signs like fever, weight loss, loss of appetite are also important things that will make you want to sit down, stop and take stock on what exactly has happened to yourself and your back pain. Of course, any previous history of injury or trauma is also important because if, that, if there's a history of preceding trauma resulting in back pain, we need to be wary whether there is a possibility of fractures. In certain patients that have chronic back pain that is very persistent, it is also important to bring yourself to the doctor for further evaluation to see exactly what's the cause. Uh, I'll go a bit into about the spine. I think some parts of it has already been explained by Dr. Ruben, but the spine is actually a complex support of the human body and it's very important because it allows to, us to walk upright and transfer some of these biomechanical forces into coordinated functional activities. And because of our ability to stand upright and uh, there is gravitational forces on our joints, discs and bones, it is prone to mechanical uh, loading and wear. So uh, this is a picture of the lumbar spine. Uh, we have uh, five lumbar vertebrae and this shows the picture on the right hand side shows the, the axial view or the cross-sectional cuts. The front part consists of the disc, the posterior portions consist of the canal behind the disc as well as the joints that we often see and complain about where the back pain comes from. The spine uh, in total consists of seven different bones in the neck, 12 in the middle back of the thoracic spine, five in the lumbar spine, five in the sacrum, and four in the coccyx. The spine is important because each of them function together to allow for movement as well as activity. The disc itself, as we have mentioned, it is a very important structure because it is a soft cushion-like structure that allows for movement. Absorbs shock, transmits load, and it, is, it has very strong fibers on the outer layers. However, as we want continues to age and grow old, this changes. And what happens is that there is loss of water, a change in the structure of the disc. It then slowly thins out and then loses water and hardens. Thus, it loses its function as a cushion. And because of the loss of the uh, cushion function of the disc, this results in a shift of the loading to the facet joints, which then can cause a lot of back pain in the elderly as well. This degeneration can occur after 30 years old. However, accelerated degeneration or wear and tear uh, can occur in certain people with certain risk factors. Occupation that requires heavy lifting and repetitive rotation and flexion does result in a faster degeneration compared to others. Activities, contact sports, uh, sporting activities like gymnastics, weightlifting also can result in further and faster wear and tear. Body weight is also important. Imagine if you have to carry a larger weight on your spine at all times, it also can further uh, increase your risk of accelerated wear and tear. So if obesity is an important issue to look at, especially if one has got back pain and not only that, pains in the joints in the lower limbs, losing weight can help to reduce some of these pains that one experiences. Of course, things that can't be changed like genetics, some people are just more prone to earlier wear and tear. Uh, this is just a very busy slide. However, it, it does explain a little bit about how wear and tear occurs from young to old when your disc starts to degenerate and dysfunction. And then when that happens and you lose this height, the bones will start to shift and form what we call spondylolisthesis. And the body's attempt to stabilize your own bone by forming your own spine by forming bone spurs. Uh, um, and having your joints growing larger or hypertrophy results in also certain problems like what we call spinal stenosis. Uh, this is an x-ray to show you what are the differences between a normal x-ray in a young patient and a less a normal x-ray with signs of degeneration. 
So as you can see, when one grows older, your this height reduces. Uh, it becomes very flattened out. The bone is almost touching each other. Two, you can see presence of these sharp bony points, what we call bone spurs or osteophytes. And of course, as the load shifts posteriorly, as we mentioned previously, the joint starts to react by growing larger uh, to the forces, and then it causes quite a fair bit of back pain. It's one of the main pain generators. Uh, and MRI is also one of the various uh, imaging modalities that we do use in our clinic. It is commonly uh, done when patients start to have symptoms of neurological deficits or nerve pain, nerve numbness, or nerve weakness. So on this uh, picture, you can see on the left-hand side is a normal MRI where uh, the, crop, the sagittal view or the sideway view shows a normal disc that's brightly colored, normal nerve roots that's not impinged. On the left-hand side, where it shows both a sideway view and a cross-sectional view, there is, there is presence of a darkened disc, what we call disc degeneration. It also shows that at the lower portions, the nerves, the, the space for the nerve is very crowded, and this is what we call spinal stenosis. So common causes of back pain in the elderly group can be anything from muscular weakness and atrophy as we continue to grow old and not do our core strengthening. It can also be due to things like degenerative discs, facet arthritis, and of course, due to conditions like spinal stenosis. Less commonly will be things like uh, fractures, especially in patients with osteoporosis or in patients who have fallen or with history of trauma, and deformity. So deformity is a condition whereby general posture is different and the patient is unable to maintain an upright posture. And this can result in pain uh, because of the postural imbalance. I'm going to go a little bit about spinal stenosis because this is a very common uh, issue that we do see in our patients that, that uh, come and seek help from us in our spine clinics. So basically, stenosis just means that the space for the nerves is narrowed. And because of the narrowing, the nerves are pinched or compressed and they can present with various different problems. They can come to us with back pain, they can come to us with back pain and leg pain. When they have leg symptoms, they generally come on about with walking, what we call claudication. Symptoms that they usually present about can be anywhere from a, a complaint of tiredness, a complaint of cramps, a complaint of a tingling or paresthesia, numbness, or even pain. So on the right-hand side, there is a a pathology picture where there's a cross section of the uh, nerves as well as what it actually looks like in a spinal stenotic patient. This is a picture where it shows that the elderly lady is quite stooped in her posture. As you notice, she's also using a walking stick in her right hand. Now, deformity is a problem that is quite often seen in our population due to various causes, and this can result in back pain. And why is this so? What has happened is that there is actually quite a, a forward CG for this patient, resulting in quite a lot of stress on the back muscles. With prolonged walking, this results in fatigue and back pain. So this stoop posture can be due to a combination of various factors due to muscle atrophy, can be also because of your this height being lost due to degeneration. And of course, more common in our population uh, can be presence of vertebral compression fractures. This is usually seen in the osteoporotic uh, population within Singapore. So how do we assess deformity in Sing Health or SGH? Uh, there is such a machine called the EOS. It is a low radiation full body X-ray that can be, can be used. You can see from the picture on the uh, right hand side, basically it can show us how upright we are standing and basically gives us an ability to calculate angles and therefore uh, can help us not only to tell how stoop the patient is or the posture of the patient is, but also help us to visualize whether there is any compensation by the patient and also plan for surgery. This is commonly used also in kids for scoliosis x-rays and for lower limb surgical planning. Next, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how does osteoporosis itself uh, affect the elderly as well as the back pain? So what exactly is osteoporosis? 
uh, osteoporosis is a problem where it affects mainly the bones or the skeleton itself. It is uh, defined by having a low bone mass per unit volume and it results in a loss of the architecture of the bone where it becomes very, very thinned out. And because of this thinned out bone structure and the loss of bone mass per unit volume, the bone becomes very fragile and is prone to fractures even with very low uh, trauma. We do have a, a diagnostic criteria which is uh, stated by the World Health Organization. Anybody with osteoporosis of less than or equals to minus 2.5 has got a uh, has got osteoporosis and severe osteoporosis are those with that diagnosis plus a fragility fracture. Ah, so this is the picture uh, that shows what is the difference between a normal bone versus a osteoporotic bone. So as mentioned previously, the bony architecture changes in osteoporosis whereby the, the little uh, supporting structures or what, what I call the honeycomb structure actually changes and becomes much more thinned up. If you imagine walking on this thinned out honeycomb structure day in and day out with little injury or impact, it can actually fracture. So uh, as mentioned, it can, osteoporosis can be diagnosed via a what we call bone mineral density test with a T-score of less than or equals to minus 2.5. All these tests can be done either in the, uh, in the polyclinic or within the hospital itself. It is also can be diagnosed when the patient already have a fragility fracture. So what exactly is a fragility fracture? So a fragility fracture is having a bony fracture that results from very low impact, usually from either from fall from a standing height or even a lower height. Normally, uh, these fractures are seen at several different locations. It can be seen from the wrist. It can be seen from the shoulder at the humerus. It can be seen at the hip at the pelvis, and of course, in the spine. So it's important to know exactly what patients and who are at risk for uh, osteoporosis. So uh, generally, this is a uh, table that shows, it's published by our Ministry of Health to let us know how do we identify these at risk patients and so that we can take precautions to slowing down or prevention of uh, osteoporosis. So importantly, we need to know whether this patient has a family history of osteoporosis or history of previous fragility fractures. Uh, important to know whether the patient has a low, low body weight, very uh, uh, thin patients tend to have a higher risk of osteoporosis. If you have a height loss of more than two centimeters within three years, that puts you at increased risk. Or if you have lost your protection of your bones by having an early menopause, which is uh, basically defined as 45 years old and younger, uh, generally your risk of getting osteoporosis is much higher. Uh, being on certain medications, for example, steroids medication uh, that actually affects the bone structure can also affect uh, or increase your risk of osteoporosis. Taking excessive uh, alcohol, reducing your calcium intake of less than 500 milligrams per day. Smoking affects bone. And of course, uh, prolonged immobility, meaning if you have been bed bound for a long period of time, uh, more wheelchair bound, all these also affects your bony structure because for bone to form, there needs to be axial loading, there needs to be bone stimulation for the bone to heal and to thicken. So, uh, or any presence of disease that can lower bone density or increase fracture, for instance, uh, renal problems, uh, hyperthyroid problems, and parathyroid problems can also result in uh, being at risk for osteoporosis. Uh, this is a self-assessment chart. Again, this can be obtained from our Ministry of Health uh, ACE website later, which I'll just flash the, the, the website URL itself. So this is a self-assessment for uh, Asian uh, postmenopausal women. If you can look at the weight as well as the uh, age, you can kind of tell where exactly you are in terms of your risk. And if you are in the high risk group of more than 20, uh, generally it is suggested that you need to visit your, your GP or your polyclinic doctor to get further uh, management so as to see where, where you are, whether you need to start, start some form of treatment or supplementation. Finally, uh, what is important to 
in the treatment. So in treatment of uh, osteoporosis, most importantly, is actually a lifestyle change. I, I think in Singapore, uh, there is a quite a high percentage of patients with osteoporosis for several reasons. Number one, I think uh, a lot of us, because we are Asians, we tend to drink milk or dairy products uh, less frequently or rather also can be due to the fact that Asians tend to be lactose intolerant. But having a good daily intake of uh, dietary calcium is important, right? So uh, we, we advised uh, at least about 1,000 milligrams per day of elemental uh, calcium for adults above 51 years old and at least about 800 milligrams a day for adults between 19 to 50 years old. Um, lactating mothers, of course, who need higher about 1,200. So where, where can you get all these calcium other than dairy products, uh, milk, cheese, uh, you can also, uh, yogurts, you can also get it from soy products, you can get it from almonds, you can get it from uh, things like sardines. So all these can, can help increase uh, your um, calcium intake and it's important because as one starts to age, we do, we do uh, lose our calcium by being not active by not being out in the sun as well. Uh, the other thing also, of course, is uh, having optimizing your vitamin D intake. Uh, for 51 to 70 years old, at least about 600 international units and 800 for anybody more than 70. Uh, vitamin D is very important and for bone health, but it's also a very easy way of obtaining vitamin D. Our skin itself is, is able to produce vitamin D when we go out in the sun. And Singapore is a very sunny and tropical country. Uh, my advice is uh, it is good to go out in the sun, exercise, walk, stimulate the bone, and also help with uh, bone growth and strengthening your bones. And of course, we know it's also very hot, but so uh, generally before 8 o'clock, you know, you can take about 15 to 30 minutes a short walk to help uh, maintain your bone health. The other important things that can be done other than walking would be things like uh, Tai Chi, uh, exercise band, ex uh, exercise bands, and of course the other things would be stopping or smoking, uh, reduce or appropriate alcohol intake, uh, reduce your risk of falls at home, footwear, having uh, handlebars at home, especially for the elderly, and uh, yeah, so that's important in terms of uh, lifestyle changes and management. So this is uh, published in the Appropriate Care Guide in uh, on the seventh of November twenty eighteen, and this is seen on the ACE uh, website. So after talking about back pain in the elderly, an osteoporosis, spinal stenosis, about the uh, anatomy, what can we do? There are usually two uh, approaches to back pain. I think Dr. So has gone through some of the parts on uh, exercises that we can do. So conservative approach uh, will be things like, uh, so it's indicated when you, there's no neurological deficits and the options can include anything from pain management like medication, acupuncture, stretching to physiotherapy. And there can be more invasive approaches to back pain, especially if it does not respond to conservative options. Uh, it can include all the way from uh, pain management techniques like an epidural steroid injection, faster blocks to manage the pain, as well as to more invasive and higher risk options like surgery. Also, I'm going to share with you a little bit, uh, just a few slides about what we can do and what we have done in SGH and myself. So basically, this is a patient with spinal stenosis. Uh, I've done what we call a T-lift or decompression and fusion surgery. Generally, we tend to do fusion surgeries in the LV as compared to uh, more arthroplasty like what Dr. Ruben has done because in the elderly, the joints are usually already very arthritic. The movement is very limited in the affected area. And therefore, by if we don't fuse the, uh, the area and instead put in a arthroplastic sort of movement, it can worsen the back pain. So generally in an elderly patient, we tend to do a fusion procedure. Okay, At the same time, we also take out the bone spurs remove the offending hypertrophic facets, and then we put in pedicle screws to help support the whole construct. What happens in fractures? So in vertebral fractures, uh, there are ways to manage it conservatively. If the uh, fracture is stable and the pain is manageable, we often use a brace as seen in this picture here. This is what we call a duet brace. However, if the patient has, still has very severe back pain, we can do what we call cementoplasty. 
is cementoplasty is a procedure whereby using a needle, we inject into the bone itself that is fractured. And to diagnose the fracture, this is usually on an MRI where we see what we call bony edema or um, a bruise in the bone, which shows that the fracture is acute. By putting cement into the area, it actually holds the bony pieces together and therefore achieves uh, what we call pain relief. Uh, of course, in very severe cases like seen in, in this patient where the bone is completely collapsed and we cannot do any cementoplasty, at the same time it is very unstable with signs of nerve compression, then we will need to do open surgery to stabilize and to decompress. So um, coming down to deformity surgery, it is also one of the uh, causes of back pain that I commonly see. Uh, and usually these surgeries are a much more major undertaking as compared to the last two that I've shown. The, because uh, I deal mainly with older patients in this older age group, they do need a longer period of post-op rehab. And it is slightly higher risk purely because not only of the age, but also because the bone is usually osteoporotic. So we have done quite a few cases and these are so this is a lady that we did uh, a deformity correction for. She has what we call a ribcage pain, purely because of a impingement of the ribcage against the iliac crest. We have kind of straightened her out. The other is a severe deformity due to severe kyphosis and flattening of the disc at the lower portions. And we also have kind of made her taller and straightened her out a little bit more. So with that, I end my talk on uh, deformity and back pain in the elderly. And I would like to pass the time next to my colleague, Dr. Marcus Ling, to talk to you about minimally invasive surgery. Hi, um, sorry, um, Samuel, can you allow me to share my video? Yes, sir, you should be okay now, yeah. All right, um, hi, Samuel, can you see and hear me? Yes, sir, yes, it's working well now. Yeah. It's working well? Yeah. All right, Th thanks, Samuel. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Marcus Ling. I'm one of the spine consultants uh, working at Singapore General Hospital. Uh, and I feel very happy and privileged uh, to be able to share with you uh, uh, my knowledge as well as experience uh, on minimally invasive spine surgery. Uh, it is something that I'm very enthusiastic at, uh, about. And uh, hopefully after talking about this, um, members of the public, uh, the attendees, the participants uh, would be more well informed and would be uh, open, uh, more open to the idea of undergoing surgery if the condition requires it. So I have got uh, no financial uh, disclosures. Okay, so this is my introductory slide. Uh, I believe uh, all of us here would have experienced some form of neck and back pain uh, at some point of our life. Uh, but the good news is that uh, all these uh, episodes of neck and back pain, they actually resolve uh, after a short period of rest and painkillers, such as uh, Panadol. Uh, only a small proportion of, the, of us will need to see a doctor, and even a smaller proportion of us will need to be evaluated and maybe undergo surgery. So a uh, majority of us, when we have back pain, uh, they usually go away on its own. So uh, let me just touch a, uh, a little bit uh, on the indications for spine surgery. I believe uh, earlier on, uh, Dr. So and Dr. Fong has uh, touched about it, uh, but let me just uh, reiterate some of the points that were mentioned earlier on. So I would think that in my uh, experience, uh, the number one indication for spine surgery would be that of nerve compression and neurological uh, injury. So as you can see in this uh, picture over here, uh, this uh, lady over here has got compression on, on one of the nerves in the lower back uh, from a herniated disc. And uh, once the herniated disc compresses on one of the spine nerves, uh, she will experience uh, 
pain as well as pains and numbness that are going down her left leg, uh, also known as a sciatica. So nerve compression is definitely one of the common causes uh, of patients who require spine surgery. Uh, another indication would be that of instability. So uh, examples of instability would be that of fracture or dislocation. Uh, in the elderly uh, population, uh, many, of our, many of our patients uh, who see us in the outpatient clinic are actually yeah, elderly patients. And as they get older, they actually develop uh, osteoporosis. And if they are not careful, they slip and fall and they injure their buttocks or their back, they may unfortunately have uh, fractures. So fracture is also another, another common indication uh, for spinal surgery. Uh, the, next, uh, the next indication for surgery would be that of uh, spinal deformity. Uh, I would think that spinal deformity can be broadly classified into two groups, uh, that in the adolescents and that in the elderly. So uh, for patients with uh, adolescent uh, scoliosis, um, they will go through some form of health screening uh, uh, conducted by Health Promotion Board when they are in their primary school. Um, and when when the, the nurses over at Health Promotion Board deem that uh, their curvature is serious, they would then be brought uh, to the clinic in which uh, the spine surgeons would do an x-ray to uh, thoroughly assess their condition and uh, to see how bad uh, their curves are. So general guidelines for patients with uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis would be for curves of more than 50 degrees to undergo surgery. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, Elderly patients uh, with degenerative scoliosis uh, may require surgery as well. The, uh, the pathophysiology of that is that of um, wear and tear of the disc, the facet joints, as well as the ligaments. And as this wear and tear process uh, progresses over the years, the patient's spine might be crooked, uh, resulting in intractable back pain and a significant disability. So the final indication for patients that requiring surgery would be that of severe backache. Um, as I've mentioned in my earlier slide, uh, almost all of us would experience some form of backache in our lives, but uh, most of these uh, episodes of backache can be uh, treated conservatively. Uh, conservative treatment will always be uh, the, the primary treatment for backache. Conservative treatment includes a short period of rest, uh, painkillers, as well as a course of physiotherapy. So physiotherapy is useful because uh, it strengthens our core muscles, which includes our abdominal muscles, our side muscles, as well as our back muscles. So once our core muscles are strengthened, uh, the support of our spine will be better. And with a better support of our spine, uh, the chances of having a recurrence backache will be uh, uh, greatly reduced. Another uh, facet of uh, physiotherapy would be that of stretching exercises. I feel that stretching exercises are incredibly useful uh, in uh, relieving back pain. Um, I'm sure after a long movie or after a long plane ride, um, once, once we're able to leave our seats, uh, the, one of the first things we'll do is to stretch our joints uh, because the stretching of our joints would relieve some of the stiffness and bring about good pain relief. Uh, my next uh, section of the talk will be to deal with the public's concern with spine surgery. And let me go uh, one by one. Number one is, uh, I, get asked th I get asked this question all the time. Will I get paralyzed after surgery? So my, my explanation to this is that uh, the risk of paralysis uh, in spine surgery uh, in this day on age is pretty low. Uh, it depends on a few factors. The first factor would be the severity of your condition. So if you have got very severe spinal cord compression and you're going for surgery, naturally the risk of paralysis will be higher simply because your spinal cord is already injured and diseased to begin with. Therefore, the threshold uh, for, for, for paralysis would be significantly lower as, co as compared to somebody with milder form of spinal cord compression. The other factor would be what kind of surgery are you doing? If you're just going for a very simple single level decompression surgery, maybe with fusion, I would say that the risk of paralysis is lower. However, if you're going for an extensive multi-level deformity correction kind of surgery, then I would say that the risk of getting paralysis would be slightly higher simply because there's mobilization of your spinal cord. 
And finally, the anatomy of your spine. If we are, if we are operating on your cervical spine, obviously the, the risk of paralysis will be higher as compared to if we're operating on your lumbar spine, simply because in your cervical spine, that's where the spinal cord is. Whereas in the lumbar spine, the spinal cord has already given out uh, its uh, nerve roots. The next question I get asked uh, fairly often is, can the surgery be performed using laser or keyhole technology? I think in this case, when we mean laser, we mean uh, radio frequency. I think radio frequency is used occasionally uh, to ablate some of the nerves, as well as to shrink a herniated disc. I think all these techniques are, uh, are useful uh, if there is very localized pain or very localized pathology. I think when people mean uh, when people mention keyhole technology, they actually refer to minimally invasive surgery, which is actually the gist of my uh, my presentation today. So I would say that yes, uh, we could use minimally invasive uh, technology in in a wide array of cases. Uh, however, uh, depending on how extensive the pathology is, if multi level fusion surgery is required, if uh, multi level um, deformity correction is required, then I would say a conventional open surgery would be more appropriate in this case. The next question is, can I still continue with my way of life after surgery? The, question, the answer is yes and no. So assuming that you are avid, or if you are avid sportsman, you are very active, and you will want to continue with your sports and way of life after surgery, then if your, if your pathology allows it, then I would recommend just going for a simple decompression surgery without fusion. Um, if, you would, if, if your pathology is very extensive and you require multi-level fusion surgery, then I would say that after surgery, your back will be stiff simply because of the presence of the rods and screws in your back. And with that uh, in place, I would think that um, going back to competitive sports would be fairly challenging. And the next question is, how long do I have to stay in hospital after surgery? So I'm proud to say that in SGH, uh, as uh, more and more of us are, are, as more and more surgeons here are embarking on early recovery after surgery, I would say that for simple surgeries like single level decompression surgeries, probably the average length of stay will be maybe one or two days. And even for complex spine surgery, I would say that the length of stay would probably be a week or two at the most. And what will my sleeping posture be after surgery? I think my answer to this question is, is as per normal. Um, you can still sleep on your back facing uh, the ceiling. There's no contraindication to that. And you do not need to uh, be worried about tossing and turning in bed, uh, simply because um, when, uh, when you're lying in bed, the bed itself will form a very good support to your spine. And I feel that um, they, there should not be any alteration in your sleeping posture after surgery. So let me move on to the next section of my talk, which is the benefits of minimally invasive spine surgery. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Why go for um, a, a big operation? Why go for a big incision when the problem can be solved using minimally invasive approaches? So the benefits would be reduce soft tissue dissection, reduce collateral damage, and when there's less trauma to the soft tissue, the risk of bleeding and infection will naturally go down. And this will also mean a reduction in the post-operative pain. Obviously, when you have a larger incision, your pain will be, uh, will be increased. And when your pain goes down, your recovery will be enhanced and therefore reducing the length of your hospital stay and thereabout bringing an earlier return to work. So a study has been conducted in 2018 uh, in which the authors polled uh, the patients. And not surprisingly, majority of them would actually prefer minimally invasive surgery over conventional open surgery. So let me talk a little bit about the evolution of minimally invasive spine surgery. So I felt that, I feel that minimally invasive spine surgery has really taken off with the advent of the operating microscope in the 1960s. So initially, the microscope was first developed for cranial surgery, but it has subsequently been brought uh, to the field of spinal surgery. The good thing about the microscope is that not only does it offer us significant magnification, it is also a very good light source, which means that we are now able to see clearer and bigger. 
and therefore, and this, and I'm sure this will translate to better patient care and safety. The next milestone in minimally invasive surgery is that of the in invention of the tubular retractor, as seen on the picture on the right. The great, the great thing about this tubular retractor is that it allows us to go down to our tissue and our, our area of interest. It allows us to just tackle the, our area of interest without any collateral damage and injuring the neighboring soft tissue. So this is an intraoperative uh, photograph of one of my colleagues who is doing minimally invasive spine surgery uh, using a tubular retractor as well as a microscope. As you can see uh, how small the tubular retractor is, and this will naturally translate to a very, very small surgical wound. So this is, uh, this is a, a photograph that I got off the internet showing coal mining. So what coal miners do is that to get down to the coal, they will actually have to dig up a lot of the ground and eventually get to uh, the source of coal that they are hunting for. But along the way, you can see a lot of uh, destruction to the environment and a removal of, uh, of, of, of earth and stuff like that. So I will compare it to that of conventional open surgery in which we actually make extensive muscle dissection and incision to get down to our area of interest. So hopefully uh, with, uh, with the application of minimally invasive spine surgery, we could avoid um, disruption uh, to the neighboring muscles. Okay, I would like to talk about endoscopic spine surgery, which I would think is the forefront of uh, minimally invasive surgery. So this uh, channel that we use is only seven millimeters and, it's a and, it, and it allows us to to do a discectomy and get down to our area of interest and, and decompress the nerve uh, with a very, very small incision. So this is a photograph, an uh, intraoperative photograph of me and my team. Uh, um, I'm coming to the end of my presentation right now, and I would like to end off uh, by a case illustration. So this is one of uh, my patients. She's a 67 year old lady. She's fairly active. Uh, with uh, medical problems of hypertension and cholesterol. So she presents to me with lower back pain that radiates to the lateral aspect of both her legs. And this is exacerbated by walking. So this is the x-ray uh, of her spine. As you can see in her lower levels of the spine, one of her bones are uh, shifted forward, what we call a spondylolisthesis. This commonly occurs uh, uh, in the elderly. And I actually did an endoscopic spine fusion for her with uh, screws, rods, and an expandable cage. And I'm able to reduce uh, the deformity that you see preoperatively. So this is her one year after surgery. Her lower limb symptoms have completely resolved. And all you can see are percutaneous uh, step incisions in her back. So no uh, whooping scars, which we would have expected uh, 10, 20 years ago. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I would like to say that all not, uh, not all spine conditions can be treated with minimally invasive surgery. However, with the advances in technology and better training, the application of minimally invasive spine surgery has expanded in recent years. And with that, I end my presentation and I'll be happy to answer uh, whatever questions uh, there are. Thank you once again. Uh, Samuel, am I supposed to answer this? Oh, hi. I, I think the question is selected by Dr. Fong. Uh, Dr. Fong, may we have your advice on this, please? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Fong, you are muted. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. Can I just look at the question that... Uh... Yes. It's, uh, ah. sorry. Okay, so basically, uh, cervical stenosis is very similar to uh, lumbar stenosis. Uh, stenosis just means that the canal is actually narrowed. So in the cervical spine or in the neck area, the space for the uh, neck nerve or the spinal cord is actually reduced. And therefore, uh, it can present with symptoms of pain as well as uh, with uh, neural uh, compression symptoms, for instance, lum numbness and weakness. And because it's in the cervical spine, um, 
it can be it can affect both the arms and the legs. However, the most common cause in our population is due to degeneration and it is a very slow uh, progressive symptom. If one has symptoms of uh, instability in the legs, numbness in the feet, weakness, or even hand signs of uh, clumsiness, numbness, or weakness, they should seek the doctor early to get x-rays and scannings done. If uh, the patient already has some form of uh, nerve compression symptoms, generally speaking, in what we call cervical stenosis with myelopathy, then it is usually a surgical form of treatment. Thank you, Dr. Fong. So I think yes, you selected uh, three questions. Uh, this is the second one. Could you have Yeah, so this one, I, I was uh, was thinking because Ruben was talking about the neck, so he could answer uh, answer this if he's still around. Uh, yep. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, my, I'm not sure if you, uh, if, if you all look at the way that you all read books, often you find that actually after reading for a while, sometimes you will naturally just look up and uh, look away. So I think it's quite different from uh, usually using devices because devices you tend to be glued all the time. And so I feel that uh, also books are able to be, um, you can position it a bit further away. And so I think these are some of the things that actually help with the posture difference uh, when it comes to uh, books versus uh, phone. Um, but really, the, the, the long and short of it is that if you read a book and you're bending all the way down like that, I think you will also have quite a fair bit of neck strain as well. So uh, in everything, it is important to really watch the posture um, when you're performing your daily activities. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. So, uh, so there's one more question on what is regabalin used for? Yeah, could uh, maybe we have Dr. Ling have to address this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Samuel, you want me to answer this? Yes, please. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. So pregabalin is, is actually a painkiller uh, that, that uh, as spine surgeons, we commonly prescribe. Uh, we usually use it for nerve pain. And yeah, I think it's, um, it's a pretty useful uh, medication, uh, mainly for patients with uh, nerve pain. And I mean nerve pain, I mean uh, shooting pain down the arms or the legs. Uh, usually when we prescribe it, we should give it uh, over a course, say four weeks or longer. I don't think there's much use in using it on and off or using it only when there's pain. I think it's a little bit different from say paracetamol or, or anti-inflammatory medicines like brufen. So yeah, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ling. I think... Uh... There's a lot, there are many questions coming from the audience and our uh, specialist has tried to address them in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, in the interest of time, maybe we can ask the, the speaker to select one question each uh, to see which one they want to address the audience before we end the sessions. Yeah. Can we start with uh, maybe Dr. Fong? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have this question about does a compression fracture due to osteoporosis in the thoracic spine need cementing? Uh, so the whole purpose of doing cementoplasty is basically a procedure to help manage pain. So if it's an acute fracture that causes pain that cannot be treated conservatively, meaning cannot be treated with just pain medication, or if the compression fracture has caused some form of further deterioration in terms of nerve compression like numbness and weakness, then generally cementing should not be used, uh, especially in neural problems. That would generally require a more invasive approach like surgery. So cementing is done in A, if the fracture is fresh, an acute fracture or less than usually three months. B, the, the patient still has pain despite being on a brace and see the patient has no uh, known numbness or weakness in the lower limbs in the thoracic spine compression fracture. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Uh, maybe now is Dr. So. Do you have any additional question you want to uh, address for the audience? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I saw a question with regards to the, the upper decompression of uh, L45 region. Uh, whether there's a space uh, there. 
So uh, in, in the, this space, and, and so I'll address that. I, I'll say that uh, when we do spine surgery, uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Fong, Dr. Ling and myself, the aim of the spine surgery is to create space for the nerve. So it is, you're right to say that there's some space in that region that is decompressed, but then th this decompressed space will fill with some scar tissue over time. The scar tissue usually is a bit softer and not as hard as bone or bone spurs. And therefore, the patient continues to have um, relief of the compression of their nerve. Uh, however, sometimes when we do the decompression of the spine, we do need to uh, stabilize the spine because the decompression is very extensive and therefore the spine is no longer stable. And that's when we may need to uh, use uh, screws and rods as what you saw in Dr. Fong and Dr. Ling's uh, slide. And of course, if it's a young patient with uh, good mobility of the spine, we sometimes do offer the option of a uh, disc replacement because the disc replacement preserves the stability and yet allows the spine to be decompressed and maintains the range of motion. However, it is important to have a good conversation with your spine specialist because I think um, the understanding what you're un undergoing and what you're experiencing is the most important and it's very tailored for every single patient and it's very different and very unique. So, uh, so it's a bit hard to be very specific when we address this question uh, in a very big context such as in this webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. So. Uh, now, lastly, maybe Dr. Ling, you have any specific question you want to help the audience with? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Samuel. Uh, so um, I was looking through um, all the all the questions that were that were asked. I think there was one that is uh, specifically to uh, minimally invasive spine surgery. I can't remember the name of the, 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 the attendee. I apologize for that. But I think he was asking if minimally invasive spine surgery can be done under local anesthesia. Uh, the, the answer is yes, it can be done under local anesthesia. In fact, uh, I was trained in a center in America that does it under local anesthesia. Uh, however, uh, we don't do it in Singapore General Hospital yet. I'm not sure if we're going to do it in the foreseeable future. Let me explain to you why. Because I feel that uh, when we're doing spine surgery, we're near, very, we're near the nerves, which are very delicate structures. Um, and sometimes when the patient is under local anesthesia, even though the patient doesn't experience much pain, sometimes he or she will move and will cough and that would make surgery uh, dangerous. Uh, yeah, therefore, I don't think uh, we will embark on uh, minimally invasive spine surgery using local anesthesia uh, anytime soon. However, if we are talking about uh, kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty, like what Dr. Fong was uh, mentioning just now, to treat osteoporotic fractures, yes, we can definitely do it under local anesthesia, but it would still be done in the operating theatre under the care of a trained anesthetist, which means the patient will be given some medication to make him feel sleepy, but he will still be breathing on his own, uh, and we can do the, the cementing of the fracture under local anesthesia. So for that aspect of minimally invasive surgery, my answer is yes. Thanks, Emil. Thanks so much, Dr. Ling. I think uh, that's, uh, unfortunately, that's the, uh, that all the time we have today. Uh, I would like to once again thank the speaker, uh, Dr. So, Dr. Fong, Dr. Ling, uh, for sharing with the audience today. I think we have a good uh, interest for the public. We have like almost 900 people sign up for this event. Uh, to the participants, thank you so much for joining us today. The event is recorded and will be uploaded to SGH YouTube about one week later. So if you want to uh, rewatch it, you feel free to go there. Uh, okay, we're going to have uh, another webinar uh, in the next few weeks. So later, we're going to share this QR code with you. Uh, if you're interested, please uh, scan the, the code and register for the event. Once again, thank you so much. Stay safe and see you online. Thank you.